I'm Tom Rowland, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey, everybody. On today's show, I get to catch up with one of my old friends, Clay Watson. Clay is a very old friend of mine, probably 25, 30 years ago when I was guiding for wrestler outfitters on the South Fork of the Snake River. I met he and his family, and they returned every year after that for for many, many years. And when they would come, I would have the pleasure of fishing with Clay and Steen, his cousin, who were just a little bit younger than me. And so that was fun for me to be fishing with people that were kind of close to my age rather than fishing with people that were 20 or 30 years older than me for a change. And I think it was fun for them because they got a little bit of freedom. But this big group of, of the entire family would come from, from their grandfather all the way down to the youngest kid, Austin, who's, uh, who's not so young anymore. But we had a great time on those trips. And one summer, you know, Jackson Hole was super crowded. River runs through it had just come out. There were so many people wanting to fish that Joe Bressler was short on guides. And he offered Clay a job after their trip on the South Fork. Clay just stuck around. He just moved into the guide compound with all of us and all of the various fishing guides living there. He just rolled out his bedroll and, and started, started working. He worked as a, as a swamper at first. And the swamper is the person who kind of does it all. It's really the best place to start as a, as a fishing guide, if you ask me, because you start from the very bottom and you work your way up, talking all the way from changing bearings on the trailers to taking the supplies down to the, to the camp whether those supplies are a quart of firewood or all the food or, or whatever. You just get a tremendous amount of opportunity to, to gain a lot of experience. Clay was that guy. Since then, we've done a lot of fishing together. We've done some hunting together, and we've done some training together. Steen also has remained a, a friend, and really really the, uh, the entire family has, uh, has remained a friend. It's been a, been a great relationship. So they continue to go on all of these trips where they go to an international destination often, sometimes just to, uh, just to Florida or the, to the Florida Keys or wherever it may be. But I know what their standards are. I know that their standards are high. I know that they've seen really good fishing. They fished with some really great guides and some great outfits. So when this family takes off and goes to a location that I've never been to, I'm extremely interested in finding out how it went because I know I know the kind of information I'm going to get. I'm sure you got your your fishing buddy. You know you you know that when he tells you something's great, it's great. Uh, it's not going to be exaggerated or blown out of proportion. It's going to be exactly like he says it is. If he says it wasn't good, it 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 probably wasn't good. It probably wasn't worth your time. Clay is is like that for me. Just a barometer of information. So Clay just returned from Cuba, and Cuba is a place that I am extremely interested in. You know, it's only 90 miles from my home in Key West. So for all the years that I lived in Key West, it it is a place that I've always wanted to visit. And I've always thought, man, it's just 90 miles that, you know, sometimes I go 90 miles in my flat skiff in a day, uh, most of the time around in circles, but that's a 90 mile straight shot right across. And the Northern side of Cuba probably has some excellent fishing, but on the Southern side of Cuba, there is a paradise waiting to be discovered. And uh, that's what Clay did. They took a mothership out to these islands that are about 60 miles off the coast of Cuba and completely uninhabited. And as Clay described, very similar to what he might imagine the Florida Keys were 150 years ago. So if that doesn't get your attention, then, you know, maybe you're not interested in fishing for fish that have never been fished for. I don't know. I am. And I love the Cuban culture. I love those fish, permit bonefish tarpon, pretty much what he's fishing for. And the idea of seeing what the Keys might have looked like 150 years ago is, is incredibly intriguing to me. So I sit down with Clay and we catch up a little bit. He, um, he just had labrum surgery uh, right after his trip. There's a fisherman for you. He waited until after the trip to get labrum surgery. But I catch up with Clay about that. We talk a lot about, about Cuba as that relates to the Florida Keys and and comparing the two. And we also talk about, you know, just in all his travels, what does he think that makes a good guide? What's his definition of a good guide or a good outfit? 
what is that X factor that some people have that just make them, you know, such a such an amazing guy? So I, I thought that was a very interesting conversation. And we're going to get to all that real soon. This episode is brought to you by Waypoint TV. It is an online streaming platform and it has only hunting and fishing content. So if you're interested in hunting and fishing content, this is the place to go. There's 2,000 shows and short films from 60 different producers, some of the best stuff ever produced and marketed for television in some cases, marketed for the internet in other cases, but it all finds a home on Waypoint TV. It's free. You can go there and uh, find out how you can download the apps, watch it on your computer, your phone, your tablet, your smart TV, while you're sitting on your couch, anytime, anywhere, anytime. Roku, Apple TV, on and on and on. Go to waypointtv.com, find out how you can get the app and binge away on all your favorite hunting and fishing shows. So, without any further ado, I would like to bring you my good friend, Clay Watson. Do you listen to many podcasts? I do. I like, there's several of them I like. Which ones? The Ford, Lance Armstrong. Oh, yeah. I really the like forward. that one. Yeah, I just found that. Yeah, it's great. I like him a lot. Did yeah. you listen to that one with Brian Fogle? I haven't, but Jason Isbell and the Avett brothers were fan-freaking-tastic. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, man, they're awesome. Well, I was interested in that one because I watched that movie, Icarus, on Netflix. I just watched that. Uh, Did you? The other night. Yeah. Yeah. That'll I, mean, blow I need to you listen away, to that right? with Brian Fogle then. Um, that whole deal was that incredible. Blows you away. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess if if I got beat by a Russian in something, I wouldn't wouldn't feel wouldn't that feel bad. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the Russian curler? The Russian oh, curler that got got, got busted popped by, for, for for steroids. Just, well, I guess he he probably got popped for um, for banned substance. So there's a big difference, I guess, between steroids and banned, banned substance. substance. Banned right. substance could be caffeine. True. Like you could you could drink two cups of caffeine. And be or coffee high. and actually pee hot for a banned substance. Which is crazy. But more than likely, it was probably something else. But what do you need to do for, for curling? What steroid makes you more flexible to get that knee up around your um, chin when your you're sliding chin. Yeah. down the... Or maybe it's the... the but you know, I, sweeping. You I read sweep somewhere where that was one of the, like the eighth most difficult sport in the Winter Olympics as far to as... Metal? Well, not only to medal, but to, um, as far as endurance goes, because what? like an entire match, you're, you're shuffling or sweeping and skating for four and a half miles on average. Really? Yeah. Well, maybe you do need steroids. So I think you need some help with that. And then you would have to practice a lot. Cause we were thinking at the gym, we were talking and we were thinking maybe Going to the Olympics would be an, a, a, a dream come true, oh, yeah. lifetime yep. accomplishment, right? Yep. So maybe we could kind of go Jamaican bobsled uh, angle and try to curl. Curl. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what America's curling team, but I was thinking we would have to find some people that had some some heritage in other countries <laughs> and then somehow somehow Sneak work that in. in. Yeah, I think I would be banned from curling because I would have too much IPA in my pee. IPA? Yeah. Like I, would, the, I would overdose the craft on beers. IPA. <laughs> that's the only way I could do it. <laughs> well, that's like bocce ball. You know, yeah. down in Key West, we have we have the bocce ball courts. And oh, yeah. I can tell you that there's a lot of drinking down there. Yeah, a little bit down there. That's the Cuban heritage, the bocce ball. I think that's a Cuban sport, right? I thought it was Italian. Is it? Well, yeah, bocce. You know. sounds bocce. That sounds yeah, Italian. It does. But either way, the Cuban culture has taken to bocce ball. Well, oh, yeah. we have like in Key West, there's like the city made these courts and like my friend Shane goes down there and, and they play and it's almost like a bowling league well, that's cool. where they go in there and yeah. every on a Thursday night or whatever, there's like a kind of a league play and you have your bocce team. Yep. And from what I could gather from Shane, there's a lot of beer drinking going on, but that's kind of like curling. Like I don't yeah. even, I mean, you kind of knock the balls off the court, kind of shuffleboard style. It's a lot more social, I would think, than curling. Yeah, because yeah. you get cold after a while. Yeah. Everybody's ready to go home. <laughs> Not everybody can skate. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't really skate. You wear those fancy shoes, yeah, the different wear, shoes. Yeah. Those kind of look like curling shoes. Curling shoes. Like the, what, what, are you have, what are what those do you have? On there? running 
on running on cloud on cloud yeah. are they squishy yeah man they feel great somebody else was wearing those I wear them because, I mean, of the shoestring system. Mm. And uh, with my arm bummed up right now, I can't tie my shoes. So. Yeah. So, sitting here looking at Clay right now, and he has, um, it's not a cast. It's like a soft no, a thing sling. with a pillow and a sling. And there's some Velcro and zippers and, and <laughs> snaps. No leather, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happened? So, um, I had labrum reattachment surgery last Tuesday to address um, I have had a torn labrum in my right shoulder in two different places and that's basically from 44 years of football wrestling rugby lifting some heavy weight every now and then riding motorcycles and mountain bikes kind of a mm. I had two pretty good I don't know I wouldn't call them wrecks but uh, I came off my mountain my uh, mountain bike one time over the handlebars pretty good last October, and then I was also on a trail out in Colorado on my big adventure motorcycle. I had no business being on, and I, I went over the handlebars on a and hit a pretty good sized rock with my shoulder. Wow! Did you do anything about it, or just kind of tough it out? No, I rubbed tough, some dirt I, on I it. Tough, rubbed some dirt on it. You know how I am sometimes, and um, I mean I was wearing protective suit at the time but i didn't realize the damage i had done and i got to the point where i couldn't brush my hair or brush my teeth with my right arm i could still cast a fly rod though that's the main wow. important thing but and so i went and had it looked at and the doctor was like buddy you have good news is you didn't do any damage to your rotator cuff but the, the bad news is, is you do have some tears in your labrum and you do need to address it if you want to remain active hmm. the downside of that is Six months, six weeks in a sling, six months recovery, meaning I'm not able to do the things I like to do, which is like ride bikes, motorcycles, fly fish. Maybe you should read that book, Relentless. I know. Not, not Relentless. Um, uh, Adam Brown's book. Um, I know. Fearless. Fearless. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reading two good ones right now. We were just talking about yeah. Adam Brown's book um, the other day with Matt Lawson on this podcast because we talked about um, him achieving that level of being a seal and then going to the next level of going to dev grew and he, he smashed his hand. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he had to learn how to shoot left handed, left handed and compete with the best shooters in the world and pass left handed, left handed. And his eye was messed up too. So he had to learn how to shoot non-dominant eye, non-dominant hand and be among the best. I mean, you're talking about just fractions of a percentage that, that oh, yeah. probably, is the difference between those guys and, yeah. and he, uh, that, that's an incredible story. It so is. if he can do that, I'm sure you can learn how to fish left-handed oh, yeah. or right left-handed. i tell you what this has done and this sound, I hope this doesn't sound too corny, but you know, I'm sitting here this week and, and not really feeling sorry for myself, but I'm like, man, this sucks to have one hand, to button my pants, to put my socks on, to put a shirt on. I think of those military personnel who have come back from with veterans who have lost a limb or even two or even four. Right. I've still got mine and I can't imagine what they're going through. So it's put it into a really interesting perspective on my part to where it's not that bad, Clay. You know, yeah. it's gonna be good. It's gonna no, be No, it's okay. not that it's not that bad. Yep. But it is inconvenient. It is inconvenient. Nobody would argue with the fact that it's inconvenient. Nope. But you'll get back to it. Yeah. So you decided to get this done right after your trip to Cuba. So yeah, I met with a doctor back in November and he kind of wanted to do it then. And I explained to him that I had this, this dream trip to Cuba coming up in, in late February that I wanted to go on it um, before I had it. Obviously once I had the procedure, I'd be out for a while. And um, so he you know, decided that was fine. No problem. You know, it's going to hurt while I was there, which I was willing to deal with the pain, but uh, sure. So I went to, Cuba, basically had the surgery a day later. I got back home. Now, how long have you been wanting to go to Cuba? Or consider, has it been on your radar? Oh, for quite a while. I mean, I'd say, well, since I started saltwater fly fishing with you 20-something years ago, mm -hmm. easily. I mean, it's always been on the radar, you know. And, you know, the more I started getting into saltwater fishing and traveling around the world to some really cool spots, the more 
Cuba just kind of lurked out there as a place I wanted to check off and explore. And uh, I've always been real hesitant due to the relationship we've had, our yeah. governments have had, or the lack of relationship we've had. And, but it opened, right? So like a year ago or around a year ago, I think there was a major breakthrough. Well, a little bit over that, Obama opened it up probably two years ago, and then uh, President Trump closed it back up when our embassy started having some issues with some of our personnel that were there. Mm. Our diplomats were getting sick um, right, they there did in that Havana. Whole, they did that thing with the, with the, like the sonic, the sonic sonar that is technology, so which they've strange. never really proven. But anyways, there was something funky going on, so the Trump administration closed it down. They have a... Um, in Havana, I think they call it a U.S. Essentials office mm -hmm. or something to that matter, where it's basically just a couple of people there in order to help U.S. citizens who may be there mm -hmm. on some sort of right. trip or mission. You can't go over there as a tourist. Um, even today, you even today go? you cannot go under so the guise of go? tourism. So we went under um, the. I guess it's called a people-to-people -people interaction. So we were there for basically research purposes mm -hmm. to where the Cuban people that weren't associated with the communist government were taking us on an educational trip. This particular one was to the Garden of mm -hmm. the Queen, Gardens of the Queen, where we were, yes, we were fishing and for a saltwater fish, but we we're also learning about the national preserve that was there how they protect it so they their national preserve operates like our national park or what similar to that they do have a protection force there that what does um, that look like uh, it, it really doesn't even doesn't look anything like our forestry service it doesn't look like anything like the military it's just a kind of a trawler that patrols mm -hmm. the the waters there around the gardens. And do, you, do you think that is mostly to keep out commercial fishermen is. or to keep out other, just any interest? Commercial fishermen, mainly, I mean, this this is 60 miles off the coast. Mm -hmm. And then you're another couple hundred north of the Cayman. So there's nothing around you. So right. it's not like you can get there. You're not going to go pleasure fish there for the day. Right. You know, you got to yeah. make a commitment to go there. And it, and it, accommodates both fishermen and divers the diving there is pretty phenomenal as well but i'll tell you this it's probably the most pristine place that i've ever fished in my entire life and i've been fortunate to go to you know to mexico to the caribbean to new zealand to belize and, and extensively in the Keys. Extensively in the Keys. And what this reminded me of is if you could go back in time 150 years ago, maybe more, to the Florida Keys, mm -hmm. that's what the area in Cuba looked like. I mean, that's that's the dream for every Florida Keys angler, really, is you, you know, you're, you're out there and there's just, I mean, the Florida Keys are beautiful. And I still think that it's one of the greatest fisheries on the planet no doubt. but when you say man what would it be like if there was no one here yeah and we had the same boat yeah like it's one thing to have nobody there and all you got is a canoe right right like, okay well you're not gonna be doing the same things that we're doing today I right mean, you might travel 100 miles in a day all up and down the the florida keys in a little flat skiff with a 90 horsepower motor right um you're going all over the place and you're hitting the right tide exactly on the right you're going ocean side then back country and you're hitting all these different tides and all these different areas and fishing for all the different fish like especially in pursuit of a slam you might need to or have or want to go a tremendous amount of, of places in the course right. of a day so if if you didn't have the equipment to do that it wouldn't quite be the same correct that's what we used to always say when i was daydreaming about man how cool would it be if we were here a hundred years ago yeah. and we had this boat and a tank of gas <laughs> yeah. and we could take off and we could do whatever we wanted to do. And we could fish the Marquesas in the morning. We could fish Island Rod mm -hmm. in the afternoon. I mean, that's a long run, but uh, it's it. possible to do. And that's really what this seems like, I guess. Very much so. And then you're, you're on a mother. Well, what was the equipment like? 
as far as like the, the, boats. the boats you're fishing in and stuff like that. Because we fished on you know, dolphin skiffs, kind of the typical skiff you'd find in the Caribbean or Mexico. Dolphin, dolphin's fine. Uh, I've seen some pictures uh, where people are fishing out of fast boats. Oh, I've seen that too. Mm-hmm. That's more on the mainland mm. when they're fishing they're catching up. tarpon, right? And there, and and of course, there's some, there's several different areas around the island, the country of Cuba, that offer the type of fishing where we were fishing for um, tarpon, bonefish, and permit. This particular one was the furthest and probably the right. most untouched out of all of them. So I'm looking at this map right here. Yep. And I have the way I have this map oriented is I can see pretty much New Orleans in the top left-hand corner. Yeah. And I'm looking at uh, the Dominican Republic kind of in the bottom mm-hmm. right-hand corner. Cancun is kind of or, or Belize would be in the bottom left-hand right. corner, and the Bahamas are kind of just off the coast of Florida. So I'm looking at Cuba and comparing it to the state of Florida. Yep. Cuba is bigger in length than the state of Florida. Right. So, you know, from Key West, I always considered Cuba to be, you could almost see it, right? It's 90 right. miles. Right. One time somebody, the mayor of Key West, Captain Tony, actually, you can go there to his bar these days, <laughs> but to show during the Cuban Missile Crisis, to show how close Cuba was to the United States, to illustrate that to the to the whole nation, he water skied from Key West to Cuba. Wow. That's a, you know, maybe <laughs> it's an urban le- legend, but he says, everybody says he did it, but you could, you could water ski 90 miles. So he, anyway, he, uh, I don't know about six foot seas, but or- you could- 15 foot tiger sharks. <laughs> he found a he found a good day to do it probably. And then you also have uh the Olympian Diana Nyad yeah. that swam just recently from from Cuba to Key West and I happened to be driving by and I noticed all these people on the beach in Key West and I was driving by and I was like what what is going on here? And there were tons of people there. And I witnessed her. I stopped the car parked and I'm watching like is somebody die out there or boat hit somebody or what is it and then i see this person come up wow and uh, i i just it was such a fluke and i was just happening to go by but i saw her surface in in key west and actually make it to the beach so anyway we're looking at a 90 mile span between the florida keys and havana but i've always thought well you could just go to havana by boat once this all opens and you could probably have really good fishing but this northern side is very close and easy to get to. But to get to where you want to go would be the equivalent of of really leaving Key West and going almost to the panhandle yeah. by boat. Right. Just to round this coast. Right. Santiago de Cuba. Is, that's Guantanamo. Is, yep. Okay, that's Guantanamo. So if you mm-hmm. went the Guantanamo way, you're talking about longer than Andros Island by one, two, Three, three times, three or four times as long along the coastline yep. as Andros Island is. And if you ever fished over there, that's a massive island. Huge. And then again, one, two Andros Islands on the bottom side of Guantanamo before you even rounded the corner to get to these islands. Right. And these islands that you visited are very similar looking to the Florida Keys. It's a chain of islands mm-hmm. that has... Some big ones and some small ones, just right. like the Keys. It looks like it has backcountry area yes. and oceanside area, a series of atolls like the Marquesas. Yep. This is also 150 miles long. So where where on this did you think that the um, the boat was anchored? Our boat? Yeah. So we, we anchored in uh, two different spots. So when we came out of the port of Hukaro. Hukaro. Where, where is that? I don't know if you can see. find that on this map. should be... Well, we landed in Camaway. Okay. So Camaway's right there. Okay. And that's in the middle of the country. Um, took a three and a half hour bus ride to the port of Ucaro. It's probably down in here. Um, from there. Due south, you think? Yeah. Okay. But interestingly, in Cuba, you, you go, to go south, you go north quite a bit. And there's <laughs> no, there aren't any straight ways down there. Anyways, and then you take a five hour, five and a half hour boat ride out to the so the Gardens. five and a half hour boat ride is because you're just kind of chugging along at a at a slow Ten pace, knots. or because of the distance. Both. Both. And it's a big boat. You're on a hundred and twenty foot mothership. That's basically your home 
for the week and wow. and you do everything other than fish off that boat and of course the skiffs are tied up to it and um very interesting way to fish that i know you've done that extensively in the keys well, and i've done a few mothership trips and and one in particular was the best trip that i've ever taken and that was to take a mothership in australia to oh yeah the, um, what was that called uh, bay of carpentaria and if you look at australia it has a peninsula that comes off to the north just like the united states has florida that comes off to the south and in australia it's on the other side of the of the hemisphere so if you go north you're going more su- more south really right, you're right, going right. more towards a tropical area right. and what i thought was really cool there is as i uh, traveled north it became more and more and more florida like even in the uh mangroves all of a sudden i'm seeing mangroves i'm seeing palm trees i'm yeah. seeing all these other uh familiar plants like stuff that looked like hibiscus and 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 azaleas and all that kind of stuff uh flowering trees like i see similar tree you know it was a little different but kind of kind of similar and uh then we go all the way to the tip of that and we take a mothership down this coastline to these river mouths that was really cool and and still to this day probably the best trip i've ever i've ever taken and i would love to do that again that that exact operation is not doing that anymore but then mothership trips to the Marquesas, mothership trips to the Dry Tortugas, mothership trips to the Everglades. Yep. And I guess that's the extent of it. But the mothership trip is a, that's an amazing way to do anything. If It, it takes a little bit of, uh, a little bit more logistics. A lot more logistics. Yeah, that's so the one thing what, that amazed me was just the logistics surrounding this. Because you got to imagine you're in, Cuba is one of the last, bastions of communism in the in the entire world right and even on the mainland it's not like there's a a walmart or a publix to go load right. up and stock your ship with to go offshore for a week and feed 10 anglers and a crew now, now before we go to there what nationality is the outfit that you're working with they're argentinian argentinians mm-hmm. argentine what canadians for some reason no, um, Argentina, uh, it's, and it also has a, an Italian influence as well. Huh. Okay, so you got um, this Argentinian outfit that somehow... Yeah. Avalon. Okay, Avalon. And they have somehow... First of all, I know from another guy that went there that they're not new. This isn't no, like no, brand no, new. No, no. They've, they've been, been doing been there this for, for a while. Like a decade. So they've got, they've got some stuff figured out, but they've got some kind of a agreement with the government yes. where they can go in there. And then, then you've got how many anglers on the boat? We had uh, nine anglers. And what do you think the capacity is? Um, they can accommodate 12 anglers. Okay, so, so you had nine and no other. There was just your party and that's it? Correct. Okay, and so think about that. And you're there for how many days? We're there from a week. Well, okay, Saturday so to Saturday. Saturday to Saturday, nine anglers, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, fresh water, yeah, fresh gasoline, water. Yeah. boats, yeah. fishing tackle, desserts, booze. What else? I mean, everything. You had a hot right? shower every day. Yeah. Okay. So how does Man. that how does that all work? I mean, and, and this is in a place where when I've heard of people going to Cuba, you're 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 only the second person that I've ever talked to that's actually fished in this area. Mm-hmm. And the first one that I talked to, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but his his trip didn't go quite as planned. Once he got to the fishing, it was good and he would definitely go back. Mm-hmm. But the logistics, it sounds like you worked out some of these logistics that he had some problems with getting there. And a bunch of his trip was chewed up with travel mm. rather than I could fishing. see that. So I think they, from, from what you've told me already before we started talking today, it sounds like they worked some of that out. But he went to Havana, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of my friends from Key West have gone to Havana for, you know, and customers like they have those doctors uh, without borders, borders and stuff right. like that. So you may have uh, a number of surgeons that have gone down there to uh, offer their services to the Cuban people and and can go in and they go right. to Havana and they're telling me all about it. Right. So things are sparse there. Like supplies yeah, so. are are really, and I've never been, I don't know anything about Cuba. This is just purely um, what I've been told. But the cars are... 1957 <laughs> Chevys, and they're like that, not because those people love antiques, but because there's nothing else available. 
and they keep them spit shined and they look really nice. But anybody that knows anything about cars looks at it and says, wow, that's a Dodge part and that's a oh, Ford yeah. part and that's a Chevy part. Yep. And now, you know, they've pieced this thing together over the years because this is what they have. And they've made this thing happen. One of my friends went there and he's a kind of a car guy and he saw this beautiful 57 Chevy was his, going to be their uh, taxi. Mm -hmm. And he got in and there were no floorboards in, in it because oh, yeah. they, they had rusted out completely. But so that's, that's of interest to me of in a place like that, where they're having trouble keeping just an automobile running, running, how does this place get all these supplies there for this boat? I mean, I, well, first of all, they've got the connections with the government, right? Which is the main thing because they are able to get, ship that stuff to the port and get it on the boat securely hmm. and keep it there. So that's the first thing you have to have is the connection to the government because yeah. the government owns everything down there. Yeah. Everything. But that takes time. I mean, you've got to know ahead of time that you've got 10 to 12 anglers coming. You've got to know, plan accordingly what they're going to eat. I was as impressed with that as anything on just our food was fantastic. It was? Considering we were... Did you eat Argentinian food or Cuban food? Just Cuban food. I mean, you ate rice and beans. It was, was a part of your meal, almost every meal. But the beauty of being out there is you ate fresh fish, fresh lobster. Where, where were that? Was somebody staying back on the boat and catching all that? Yeah, the crew, crew was in charge of getting all that. And Did that seem like that was any sort of a hassle? Or that not was at all. Plentiful, we, had, we had more food than we could eat. Right, so every day they're like, check out this big mutton snapper we just caught yep. off the back of the boat. Yep. And if we ended up... You could probably keep Goliath groupers there too, no problem. You you, you could. I don't think anybody's... If you could catch them. them. Um, they don't have the same regulations as we do in the United States probably. So no. One, one uh, Goliath grouper could go a long way. Go a long way. And we saw some big, big fish, mm -hmm. big snappers. And, you know, if one of us caught one, you know, at the end of the day, we'd keep it and eat yeah. it that night. It was great. But, yeah, but the logistic thing was just phenomenal. And, and that's... On the flip side, it was also kind of humbling and scary at the same time because what if something happened? Right. You know, that's always in the back of your mind. I mean, you're in trouble. If something. Well, happened. even even then, even if you do, like when I went to Australia, we did that thing where you like um, global rescue. Yeah, you had the you had the plane that would come pick you up anywhere. But then when I'm in when I'm at the northernmost part of this and I had to do two puddle jumpers to get there, yeah. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to have to do two puddle jumpers to get out for yep. that plane to come get me yep. or a helicopter or something. I would imagine that that's the same way with, with Cuba. I mean, there's only so many airstrips probably. There, there are so many airstrips and I, I, I can't remember which company I looked at, um, but one or maybe both of them didn't operate in Cuba. <laughs> yeah. So, so did everybody own. stay healthy? Yeah, pretty much. Everybody. I mean, you know, you always got that person that gets hooked in the cheek or in the back oh. of the neck. I mean, we were dealing with 30 and 40 knot winds every day, which made wow. it tough. But, um, you know, you have to, you have to know your tricks to get those hooks out. Yeah. Um, well, the hooks out, but mostly on my travels, I've seen people have intestinal, intestinal yeah, issues. No, um, I mean, never, Get a little bit of that, but nothing major. Yeah. You know, just the normal. So you decided that you were not going to go to Havana. Correct. Like that was, you, you con we consciously bypassed. bypassed that. Why, why did you do that? Well, we had heard that kind of the, where the U.S. citizens were having the most, more of their problems were, was in Havana. Oh. Plus. Like what kind of problems? Well, just, you know, the whole diplomatic oh. situation there. And that probably wasn't the the main reason we skipped Havana because I would love to go and see the place, but it was a seven hour bus ride from Havana to the port versus a three hour bus ride to the port going through Camaway. Yeah. So we really didn't feel like spending and not and being our first time. Mm -hmm. Like when I go back, I'll probably go to Havana, you yeah. know, and check it out. Um, but we just decided to bypass it all together. However, uh, one of the, the guys in our group had his passport stolen what? and um, had to go to Havana, wait out. What? And that was on Saturday. and had to. Y'all just left him? We just left. He was a world traveler. Very, we're very well versed. It wasn't his first time in Cuba either. And he's home now. He's fine. It just took him the five extra days to Dang. get out. I so, thought that was going to happen to us in, uh, in Christmas Island. Uh, they took all our passports. Oh, and, yeah. Um, then they disappeared back into this office. And then when they came back out, 
they didn't have this one guy's passport. Huh. And he went back in there. Wait, was that? No, that was not Christmas Island. Christmas Island was easy. There was no problem there. This was uh, when I went dove hunting in Argentina. Argentina. And we went down there and they came back out of this office and did not have this one person's passport. Yeah. And so he starts, scary. he starts kind of freaking out a little bit, knocking on the door, asking to see, you know, anybody else in charge, or whatever. Finally, they let him back into the office and, uh, and he himself goes and looks all through this office and he finds it. And apparently, I don't know if this is how it happened or not, but apparently it had slipped off the back of the desk and it was, uh, down behind the desk up against the wall. Oh my. Now I don't know if that was yeah. intentional or not intentional. Right. But if this guy had not have if he had not been so insistent, he would have oh, been stuck there stuck. without a passport. Yeah. And that's not a good that's not yeah. a good thing. That's why you always that's why um, copies. Yeah. And, do you do that? I carry copies and um now they also have that little passport card. Mm. You can get, even though it's not valid in Cuba, but you have it and it's a form of ID with your picture on right. it. Right. It's something. I highly suggest that. It's got that. your passport number yeah. on it. It's got all that stuff. It has all that. It, it just expedites, expedites the whole process. But I will say this, Cuban people were fantastic. Oh, yeah. They were the nicest folks. And for, and you know, we judge them for having nothing just by, from materialistic types of things. Well, they... Even though they don't have some of the things we have here, they're happy people. Most of them are pretty happy. Yeah. For from the looks of it, now I don't, I didn't dig dig down deep and go spend the day with them in the outside their homes and hear the real story. But right. from what I saw, they were they were very nice and cordial to the Americans, to us. So you got the feeling that I mean, it's one thing for the for the person that's working in the airport and and they, you know, that's the face that you're right, going to see. Right. And it's one you could put. You sure. put the right person in that place. But did you encounter some other people outside of like maybe uh, shop owners or yeah. other people that didn't really expect to see Americans there all of a sudden? And then they're super nice also. I don't know if they didn't expect to see Americans there. They didn't see them as often as they, as you would imagine. Right. You know, they see more Canadians and Europeans. Mm -hmm. They have been for years. I think they appreciated the Americans, I mean, we're, we're, most of us are fairly nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, I would think that they would appreciate tourism. They, any, they do. From any country. They do. And especially when you spend a little money with them, that, that goes yeah. a long way. So the place that my, my other friend had a problem and I just, you just, when we were talking about Havana, that's, that's where it was because he went to Havana and then he took that seven hour bus ride yeah. instead of what you did. But instead of seven hours, that took like more like 11. <sighs> yeah. It was supposed to take seven. And then he was supposed to get on the boat. But this whole thing got delayed like a, an entire day somehow, bus mm -hmm. trouble or whatever he had. Yep. And so he didn't get on the boat until a certain, you know, a day later than he was supposed to. Right. Then they chug out there all that time chugging out there. And then he ended up only fishing for Maybe he was supposed to fish for four days and he only got three. Oh, wow. And he did that because he had to go back and then he had right. to do the seven-hour bus ride, which was more like an 11-hour bus ride. And that's what he said. He said, man, once I got to the fishing, it was great. Yeah. But until they work out these logistics, I'm not going back. But sounds like you worked out, a, I was took a significant chunk out of that. Yeah, it was, um, it was, I won't say it was easy, but it was... Um, seamless. I mean, mm -hmm. they, so, so you get out on the, um, how, how did it work with the, did they just have some skiffs, the dolphins on the boat? Were they on so, the boat or were they? So they keep a fleet of them. They have another kind of floating mothership out there just for their diving mm -hmm. operations. And they keep their skiffs hooked up to it as well. And, um, they kept two of the skiffs uh, tied up to our boat and the other were tied up there probably a half a mile away where they maintained the skiffs and, and filled them up every day with fuel. Um, so they actually keep them out there. Um, so that diving operation, it looks to me like when I'm looking at this map here, 
right on the massive. edge. It looks like it drops off to a thousand feet deep. Yeah, the Jamaican Trench is wow. right there. There were we met some guys scouting for Shark Week down there really? on this trip. Yep, like American guy, like from the Discovery yep. Channel. Yeah, or like they the were Discovery. Fishers? Fisher people. No, these are these are guys who work for Discovery Channel. Uh-huh. And he had already filmed a couple of them in the previous years, and and we were talking. They had seen us fishing, and they were talking about the diving, and he was talking about how awesome it was. And they were actually uh, seeing the tarpon starting to stage up. Really? Some Did the, he say that that um, that reef was alive? Oh yeah. I mean, like you know, a lot of the Florida Keys reef is not alive. I know uh, it's very much alive down wow. there. Very. So that's probably. 200 miles of at least that we're looking at. Yeah, at least that. That'd be incredible. Yeah. And I want to go. It was fantastic. I mean, we'll definitely go back. You know, we, we really didn't know what to expect, you know. Um, how, how much of this do you think you covered? I mean, the thing's <laughs> 150 miles long. I mean, do you think on any given day you went more than 10 miles from where the boat was? Yeah, because we moved. Oh, the um, boat moved. We, we moved. Um, well, let's like, go let's go through it like well, day one what what do you what is what happens on day one day one um and i i don't have my notes in front of me so I, I can't tell you i think it was like the canal de caba caballeros or something like that and i probably butchered that up and i apologize but we stayed in kind of a protected cut in the islands the first night fished around there for like a seven hour day and that's another thing about mothership fishing in general is your fishing days are longer mm-hmm. i mean we were on the water at 8 a.m and you weren't back to the boat until five and wow. it was all fishing yeah you know where most places you go i know in mexico when you're back on the beach at four o'clock and you're yeah. and it takes a while to get to and from the fishing grounds this was incredible you're fishing um, immediately so first day we fished and actually the first day we fished probably like seven o'clock then you um, get up the next morning, and we headed, we motored pretty far east because the boat was moving about 20 miles that day to us to the east. Oh, okay. So the boat takes off, and you just kind of catch up later. Yeah, we catch up later um, in another kind of protective cove. We fished around there for three days, and then on the last night, we moved back to where we were the first night and fit back to the west so we could take that straight shot oh, back cool. to the port. Um, and we fished around there um, on the last day. So you have abbreviated first days and last days yeah. as far as your fishing hours, but you're not losing any time getting to the fishing grounds. You're there. So the first day and the last day is a little bit abbreviated. And then yep. how many days did you fish in between? In the- um, five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so for for a lot of people, they might not understand exactly the draw of this. If you haven't fished in the Florida Keys, Florida Keys is just amazing because of the variety. The one thing that this probably would not have, I don't know, maybe it would. Maybe there'd be some some rivers coming out here and you could have some Everglades type areas yeah. up in on the mainland here, but I mean, the Everglades is a is a super special place and that's one of the things that makes the Florida Keys true. One of the greatest places in the world to fish is that you have this you have this amazing variety of everything from freshwater and freshwater turning into saltwater in these brackish type environments all through the Everglades National Park, right. which is completely uninhabited by authority of the, the National Park Service because the Everglades is, is a national park. So you can't go, just go build a house in there or anything like that. But the Everglades is, is amazing. And then that kind of Florida Bay kind of turns into the Florida Keys and you have this backcountry area where there's this big mixing of Everglades water, mm-hmm. Gulf water, and Atlantic Ocean water. And you have these big tidal differences where it might be four hours or five hours different. If it's a high tide at 12 o'clock on the ocean, it might be a high tide at five o'clock in the, in the backcountry. So that gives you this, this amazing ability to move around and hit whatever tide you want, right. which is really cool. And then you have... So up in the Everglades, you'll have redfish, snook, of course, sharks and stuff like that. But also all the way up, you could can, you could take that all the way up and fish for largemouth bass if right. you wanted to. Then as you get into this this other area, out of the out of a little skiff, you could probably fish for about forty different species of fish, That's right? In the Florida yep. Keys, then you can go out front 
and probably fish for another 40 different species of fish in an offshore boat. So right. that's one of the things that, that makes the Florida Keys such an incredible place and really very few places can, can um, compete with that, the, the variety and then the accessibility. Like we could be fishing for a swordfish 20 miles off the coast of uh, pretty much anywhere in the Florida Keys. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be water that's 2,000 feet deep. Right. You go off of uh, South Carolina, you can fish for the same swordfish, <laughs> but you're going to take, get there. yeah, it's going to take you a long way. Yeah. I mean, way more than a hundred miles to get into sailfish water. Right. Same thing in, in a lot of these places is that, is that the, the fish are there if you are tough enough, have the equipment, the desire to go that far. Right. You don't have to in the Florida Keys. And what I'm looking at here in, in Cuba is that same kind of thing, maybe possibly with the exception of the Everglades, but you've got this backcountry area, you've got this ocean area. It's only 150 miles away from the Florida Keys, so you're going to have all the same species mm-hmm. of fish there, which is really important to me when I go plan a trip. It's like, okay, you're going to go someplace to catch bonefish. Right. Well, what happens if bone fishing's not that good. What are we going to do then? Because I don't know about you, man, but that's usually what, <laughs> that's usually what happens. I mean, yeah, yeah. occasionally if you, if you put in your time, you're going to hit it right. Right. But you're also in order to hit it right. You're going to have to put in your time and you're going to have to hit it tough. wrong a lot of times. Yes. And there are places that you can go in this world where you're going to fish for bonefish. And if they're not there or it's not happening, or if it just got a little colder or if it got cloudy, man, you're out of luck. Yep. I mean, you're going to, you can still fish for them in a lot of different ways, but that's the thing about the Florida Keys that I've always liked so much is that if you go down there for bonefish or permit and all of a sudden it gets windy and cloudy, there's still lots of other things that you could do. I mean, you're coming from Ohio. You don't get to the Keys very often. It's not cold to you, right? Like it's, it's. (laughs) <laughs> it's negative three where you live right, and right. it's it's 60 and these guys are crying, you know, and saying, oh, we're not going to catch anything today. And the wind's not blowing that hard. I mean, right. it's blowing 20 and it's 60, but you could still go out and you could catch gag groupers. You could, you could throw the cast net, catch pilchards and make all kinds of stuff happen. Yep. The snook fishing and the red fishing it's can fantastic. be really good. But there's the point of it is, is that there's all these plan Bs. Right. C, D, E, F, G, H. And that's why, you know, that's another reason why in the Florida Keys, the guides there can fish 300 days a year. Right. Because no, there's no possible way that it's going to be 300 days a year of tarpon fishing. Right. Right. There, there's going to be days when you don't even see a tarpon. Correct. But there are other things you can do. And that's what's so intriguing about this, this Cuba place to me is that it's very similar. You've got all of these different, different opportunities and this is before these guys even discover a bay boat with a 150 gallon <laughs> live well i mean correct seriously well like, now in the in the gardens of the queen it's fly fishing only okay by by law by law okay and catch and release catch and release catch and release fly and fishing they, only but what about where these guys are catching your your dinner well that's was well, for the specific game fish okay for so the catch and fish, release the permit the tarpon for do- those three, yeah. Do they have snook? Did you see any snook? No, they do have snook up by the mainland. Um, however, it's super overfished. Oh, it's not as protected. Well, see, that's the a, other thing that I had heard, and maybe you can tell me if this is right or not. But this group of islands was pointed out to me by Jeffrey Cardenas twenty mm-hmm. years ago, and he said that's going to be the place. <laughs> and he said these other places, and Jeffrey's Jeffrey's of Cuban descent, and he knows a lot about Cuba. In fact, there's even a Cardenas Cuba. I don't know if that has anything to do with his exact heritage, but he was pointing this out, and he said, he showed me all these other areas, and he says, yeah, they can get there and net there. Right. The people can. Right. And they need to, because that is a major source of food, right. and that goes back to feed all these villages and everything else. So he was basically saying, anywhere where there's a road and you can get there, it's going to be tough. Tough. Because there's going to be a gill net yeah. that lives there all the time. But this is... Hard to get what, to. 50 miles, 60 miles? 60 miles offshore. And so how deep is this water, this it's lighter pretty, blue water between the... I the, don't know the exacts, but it was, I mean, it was pretty deep. I mean, you, we were we were in six, seven foot seas coming back. Oh, man. So, I mean, it's deep water. Right. So you're not getting out there in a little, little skiff. No, no, no. Not right. at all. No. 
And then, um, man, that is, that is super cool. That's really my, my, um, fascination with this is that it, it would be an amazing place and it will be if you can, if you can get this, uh, logistics of travel down and maybe one day, maybe one day they'll, um, they'll have that. So do you think there's more than, than that one airport that you went to? There's probably airports all over this place. The main airports, um, Havana and Camaway are your main ones. And then, um, I think Santiago down on the far East is, is another one. So when you're, when you're out there, um, talking to the crew, are they seeing many Americans? They're starting to see more and more, but it's mainly Europeans. Mm-hmm. And Still. so when did they give you, I mean, of anyone, I would think they would have the line on kind of what the politics are about opening this up and making it easier. Well, I mean, they, they hope that it becomes easier because they, they, again, they like the American culture. They well, like there's them, plenty of people that would love to love to go down there. Yeah. You know, I think we could, and I'm not saying this as a capitalist by any stretch of imagination, but I think we could bring a lot of good to that area. And at the same time, I, I'm glad, and this sounds crazy, but I'm kind of glad that the relations haven't been that good down there because I would be afraid of what, if we had gotten our hands on this area a hundred years ago, what would it look Man. like today? I mean, it, like the, it depends on if you, if you, uh, it would depend on if you sprayed for mosquitoes or not, because yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's always my thing about Florida is, you know, Florida's, uh, Florida's very popular these days, but you take away air conditioning and you don't spray for mosquitoes and not many people want to live there. You're right. You know, that's true. But I mean, there was no tiki bars or there's no right. sea dews, you know, there's, right. it's just, uh, it's just a whole nother, uh, from a saltwater fisherman, it was just a pleasure to go down there and not see another boat, you know, not see a house. I mean, and, yeah. and it's just fan just to be out there in, in the wild. And that's basically what you, where you were. And, mm-hmm. you know, and going, going to the fishing part of it, that was, that was just the bonus part. Um, the fishing was, it was good. But I saw with my own eyes how incredible it could have been. I mean, we were dealing with 30 to 40 knot winds every day. And there, the guides were skilled enough to get us out, out of the wind, um, put us in some, some ideal casting situations. However, it made the permit fishing extremely difficult. But I can tell you what I saw down there in the permit fishing and this wasn't sold to us, you know, or advertised to us when we were looking into this trip. wasn't wasn't built as a permit spot. It was built more as a big bonefish spot. Mm-hmm. But the permit down there were numerous, and it might have been the time we were there. But some of the happiest permit I've ever we're, seen. What, in my life. what what kind of situations were you seeing? Like singles or doubles or schools or no singles and doubles? Because I mean, you know, because with your experience, the the big ones don't school up as much. They're in the twos mm-hmm. and the fours or singles. And so you're seeing more of that, but you're seeing the tailing. Mm. I'm talking the hardcore diggers. Wow. Mainly ocean side fish mm. that were just patrolling these coral, exposed coral reefs in low tide. And it was really cool to see these big fish get up in these little tiny skinny water yeah. turn sideways to get through certain passages in order to eat these yeah. crabs and then they had the skill enough to get back out into the deeper water but it was very as anglers it was tough to present you know so is that super crabs hard bottom them. like a reef reef edge? yes yeah and it was That's so like contrail reef in um in in outside of key west they they do the same thing and they'll be like they'll be like waves sometimes even crashing over that yes. like small small waves not like surfing size waves but but small waves they look like surfing waves but they're you know uh, six yeah. eight inches high yeah. and they're going and then that fish is up in there and he's on his head and then the wave goes over and almost to his gills yeah. is exposed i mean you're yeah. almost looking at an entire fish yes the guy in the back's like well did you see that one yeah 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 <laughs> there's a fish yeah. out of the water right there i'm sure you could see that one but that's a cool place, and that that situation, in my opinion, is a place where you can you can catch them if you don't get your line hung in that's, the reef. That and you got to keep your boat off the reef right. too. I know, and that's that's, that's tricky. Tough. That's super tricky because yeah. those waves are pushing you in, in, and there's a place where 
it's like a sweet spot. It's like, it's like a place where as a surfer, you're trying to catch the wave. And if you're 10 feet off of that, you don't catch the wave. If you're 10 feet ahead of that, the wave crashes on you yep. and you find that sweet spot. And so the sweet spot in the boat is obviously you want to be back the 10 feet where you don't catch the wave. Yep. You definitely don't want to be the 10 feet in front where, right. where it smashes you right into the reef. And a, and, a, and a guide that doesn't do that very often, it's very, very, very easy difficult. to do that when the wind's blowing and you're, you're, all you got is a push pole. I mean, that's, that can be really, really difficult to do that. What did you think about the guides? I, I thought they were, they were phenomenal. They were very accommodating. They really knew their territory. They knew their species they were fishing. For and what constantly amazes me, whether I'm in Mexico or in Cuba, you know, they don't have GPSs. Yeah. They don't have cell phones. They know when the tide is just by fishing it their entire life. Yeah. Um, and they fish it every day. And they are specific on their fly patterns, but they, they almost know these fish by first name. And they don't get worked up. I mean, they don't get bent on. They want you to have a good time. They want you to have success. But, you know, success is not necessarily boating a fish. Right. And uh, they understand that. So these guys, do you, w did you get the, the, the kind of feeling like the guides that were out there were out there for months at a time and then they would alternate them? Or, no. Or they, they had a staff that stayed all the time? They, they would go basically week on, week off, get back to shore to their families. Yeah. So and they and we so these are Cuban guides or Argentinian. They guides? have to be Cuban. Oh, they they have to be Cuban, which I would rather than be Cuban wow. as well. You know, I That's think there's crazy. a new law like that in the Bahamas, if I'm not mistaken, where yeah, their guides have to be Bahamian. Yeah, the Bahamian the, that that whole deal got spiraled way out of control, and and there, it was very controversial, very controversial even among the people that I know that go down there and wildly different opinions on, on which was right and which was wrong. Pretty much no one can fish. I mean, the idea that was proposed was that you could not fish with a hand line, with a Zebco little kid rod for a, a two inch snapper or a bonefish or a Jack Crevel or anything. You could not fish without having a Bahamian guide with you, right? Gotcha. So that, man, I don't know what I thought about that because I actually was having this conversation with some people in the Bahamas and the opinions were like, it was almost like, you know, Republican or Democrat. Like <laughs> it was either hardcore one way or hardcore the, the other, other way. And my feeling was, man, I'm not sure that's, like I get the point. I get the point that they're trying to protect that fishery and they're trying to protect um, the Bahamians' way of life. That's sure. awesome. Yeah. But in doing that, at that extreme, like I took a trip down there uh, a couple years ago. It's still one of my favorite trips that I've ever taken. We went to a place called Elbow Key. We rented a boat and then we hired guides. I went and fished with a guide in... Um, in the marls there on, oh, yeah. on Abaco yeah. and uh, right in front of Oliver White's place. And I had a guide and we, we fished right there. And then the next day, but I also had a boat. So I've got uh, Cynthia and Hannah stay back and we go and fish on this boat. So the next day, this guide was so awesome and the fishing was so good. I said, hey, could you just take the boys? I mean, I felt totally fine about it. So the boys, the next day, they take the ferry over. They get with the guide. They go and do their fishing all day. Well, me and Cynthia and Hannah get in our boat and we just start doing a little island hopping. I stop at a couple of flats, make a couple of casts, catch a bonefish, catch a mutton snapper. No big deal. Just, just stopped. Yeah. I, I've got my daughter, put her on my shoulders and we're walking through yeah. the, we're walking through the flat and, you know, we catch a, this mutton snapper. I show it to her and everything. And then, uh, you know, maybe she might've wanted to catch a couple of snappers. We catch some snappers and go home. Have a great day. Yeah. But I think that, so in that, in that situation, I rented a boat from a Bahamian. Mm -hmm. I hired a Bahamian as a guide. Right. We paid the ferry. We paid for fuel. I don't know what else I bought. I probably bought lunch for the boys to go over there from You're the little shop. You're giving back to the Bahamians. Right. Yeah. And so, but the point is, is that if that was, I know that a lot of people book their trips like that. Like, 
I just want to walk along the beach and, and catch a couple of fish. Right. And I also want to go for guided trips. Right. Well, I think that if you took away that, that opportunity to just rent a boat and do try, it try it yourself, yeah. which you're not going to catch much. Right. I mean, you're really not you going to. You need that to. local knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but a guy like me, that wasn't the point of the day. The point of the day was to take my wife and daughter out and maybe I catch something. Right. It'd be cool if I did. That'd be great. But that's kind of the whole point of the, the trip. So I gave money back to the economy by renting the boat and by doing yeah. all this. And I also gave money back to the economy to, to do this. And I think that overall, it's great for the entire, entire bah- Bahamian economy. economy. Yeah. But there, were, there was a faction that was just so dead set that no, if you come down here and you fish, it's going to be a significant penalty. Yeah. And so now you're kind of like, well, I mean, if I just want to try, you know, I, I, I go to the lodge and I want to just cast my line out there. I mean, is that considered fishing? Because <laughs> I'm just practicing for tomorrow. Do I need a guide with me for that? And then it gets to this, I think that it could get to this situation to where People just say, nah, I'll go to Mexico. Right. Or I'll go to I'll go to the Florida Keys or I'll go to Christmas Island or there's a zillion other places. And I don't think that they I don't think that they're thinking that, that they're thinking, man, all these people are coming down here and they are spoiling our fisheries and not not utilizing our guides. So we're gonna get, take this extreme. But I don't think that they realize like for American anglers or Canadian anglers or 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 so many of these other people that the Bahamas and the Florida Keys and Cuba and all of these places are just one place that you could go. And there's lots of other places. No, a ton of places. So I think that it's a mistake to to make it in any way intimidating. I think that you need to open it up more for tourism, right? Like, I agree. But, but I, I think also too, they want to keep a small part of that is they want to keep that American guide from spending his winters. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, guiding See, down there and taking that potential in, income away from. I, a I don't local. have a problem with that. So you've got to be you've got to be Bahamian to guide. You've right. got to be Cuban to guide. I right. don't have a problem with that. Right. Now, could you be? Could you own the lodge as an American? Because there are situations like that to where right. the American can own the lodge, but he has to employ all Bahamian Bahamians. guides. Right. I don't think that's such a bad thing because the Bah the American may have all of these contacts that. It's going to be instant revenue, Correct. right? And he's going to employ 10 guides instantly right. by setting up this lodge. Otherwise, it's going to take 10 years to develop those to or, build it. or never. They may never build those things. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not behaving. I'm not advocating one way or another. No, I'm no, just no, saying no. that I think that going to the extreme on those things it, it could be a mistake for certain, certain locations. I think it's great that, that the Cuban that they would have to be Cubans. And that's the same situation. They're letting an Argentinian group come in here, but they have to employ Cubans. Correct. Now, how weird is it for those, those Cuban guys that are um, going out there and then returning to their family and they're saying, yeah, there are these islands way out there. Didn't even know they were there. I mean, yeah. they probably have never been there before, right? Well, I mean, until the first day until they this went. Big, well, until, yeah. yeah, I know, but I mean, they're living on Cuba. And, and they might have heard stories about it, you know, living in the port town. You hear of the fishermen coming back from finding these islands and stuff like that. But it's not like you can just get in there on a Saturday morning in a boat with your buddies and head out there. Right. It's a little bit more than that. Yeah. Um, but the deal is, I mean, these guides are in a fraternity of, of fishing guides in Cuba that, I mean, it's a privilege to get that call to work for one of those outfitters. There's only just a couple of outfitters in Cuba altogether, but that's a great source of income. I mean, I think I heard, and I may be wrong on my statistics, but the average monthly wage is like 29 Cuban dollars. What is a Cuban dollar compared Co- to a Cooks, U- U.S. dollar? CUCs. Uh, it's almost one-to-one if I, if I, my math's correct. And it would probably be nothing for a Canadian or American to slip that guy 50. Well, after a day of fishing, what, well, what was the t- deal on tipping? That was, that was one of the, 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 I won't call it a deal, but it was 400 cooks for the week really? for the week. And these guys were with you from eight to four and, and you had to be real careful 
because politics did come into play and the role of communism did as well is you, they really stressed against the, the, the group leaders stressed against going all quote American on these guys well, that's and, and what I was throwing a thousand dollars to them because right. all of a sudden they're on an, the whole deal about communism is everybody's equal. Right. You know, well, supposed to be. Right. And you didn't want to give this guy too much more than the other guys. So we all really made a conscious effort to tip our guides the same or around the same amount of money. Yeah, I can see that. But I was wondering when I said, what's the deal with the tipping? I kind of figured that the Argentinian people would give you a little coaching as to, they did. look, this is too much. They Don't did. do this. But do not overdo because it. Because you're going to, you, you unknowingly, you're giving that person a year's salary. Yes. Right? And now he might not show up well, back that's to a, work. That's because a, it's yeah. I mean, he just just made a hundred thousand dollars. It's like giving somebody a yeah. hundred thousand dollars and do, does he need to come back? I don't know. I mean, you always wonder that. I was in uh Honduras one time and and fishing there and just did our fishing and we had to go and meet this guy and in the most severe third world situation that I've seen. Yeah. I didn't really think of too much about it. I gave him my sunglasses. I gave him all this whole box of flies that I had because he had nothing and he was really, really a good kid. And so at the end of the trip, I'm like, well, I don't need these anymore. I don't need this anymore. I don't need this anymore. I gave him a buff and t-shirt and he had no sunscreen, nothing. He had nothing. Right. And so I give him all this stuff and then I give him a hundred dollar bill and just walk away. You know, I didn't, didn't think anything of it until I got back. And I was like, man, that a lot I'll of just ruin this guy. I mean, I hope I didn't ruin. Yeah. I mean, it was totally unintentional. It's true. And it was it was out of man, I'm a fishing guide too and this is what people do for me and I'm really right. really appreciative of it and you did a great job, but is that the right thing to do? Like really? Like yeah. do you really just throw somebody the equivalent of a year's salary? Yeah. I mean, is, are you doing the guy any favors? I don't you want to, you want to. because you just so they have families that right. have needs. You're, you're and... trying to help, but are you helping too much? I guess. Well, and so fear. the Argentinians, they told you, they told you, don't go all American on them. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. That's what they said. Um, and so we didn't. But that, but they're very appreciative of anything they got at that point. And, yeah. Um, but overall, I was impressed with the Cuban guides. They were very, very um, friendly and amicable and, and approachable and. And they knew the fishing. Um, they knew the fishing, and they knew you know, the only I would I would for the first timer or the or the new the person looking to go get into saltwater fishing for the first time. I wouldn't recommend jumping off and going to Cuba mm -hmm. for the first time. We had a couple of those guys on our trip, but they were there with other people that helped them along the way. But it, there's a big drop off when you. When you're learning how to fish in a in the Florida Keys versus learning how to fish in Mexico or Cuba. You mean a big drop off as to the, the, the instruction? Edu instructional part of it. I mean the the Americans, the the guides here, yes, you pay more money, um, but for what you get education wise and instruction wise is just exponentially more. I mean, they're going to the guides here are going to basically do everything for you but actually put the fly in front of the fish but they're going to tell you exactly where that fish is mm -hmm. exactly what the attitude of that fish is and when to do it how and on top to, of that they're they're going you know you're talking about florida keys guides and, yeah. and they have the best possible equipment they do yeah, they i do. mean it just came out like last week and it's on the boat yeah like yeah you know and they're if if they if they do break down which does happen they know the mechanic and they're right in there right. and you're probably back out before lunch. Right. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of advantages to going and staying in the United States. I mean, a lot. You have a problem, you got a hospital. You got a problem, there's, you know, you're, you're there. There's a fix. Yeah. But the Cuba thing is, is of interest just because it's I, mean, an adventure. I just keep thinking, man, and I thought I've, I've uh, daydreamed about this for literally for years like what would the keys be like <laughs> go to cuba ago. and you'll well, see yeah <laughs> i mean it's a it's truly it was the the bonefish there were big and and um, what do you think the biggest one anybody caught on your trip was uh i think 
we had a nine pounder that turned into a five pounder by virtue of a shark. Yeah. Uh, which has happened to me in the keys many times, but, uh, I know the largest fish I boated was around seven pounds. I saw a few fish that were well above double digits that, um, as we were coming onto the flat, they were leaving mm -hmm. as most big ones do. Um, I think it's probably the largest fish probably caught was an eight pounder. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just, um, that's a, that's, that's a, a nice serious fish. Bone fish. And I would imagine that if you got down there and really, really uh, honed looked, in on them, you at, could find, I some. mean, there's plenty of areas in the, in the Florida Keys where it's a small fish area and, and they may be more plentiful, but they're, you're probably not going to catch a nine pounder there, but right. then there's other areas where you're only going to catch nine pounders. Right. And I'm sure that if you got down in there and, and had time to, really look around i'm sure you would find the same thing did you see tarpon yeah yeah did they talk about the tarpon like coming through like they do in the keys yeah they did and um there's a big migration there as well and um they have some really big fish that come do in. they fish them the same way they do like lot, on the ocean side and on the ocean side they stake out a lot the guides love it because it's a yeah, easier, they don't have to do anything. easier day for them <laughs> um but the cool thing is is they can tuck in and go permit and bone fishing just like the keys it's, yeah. it's pretty daggum easy to do that but when it's when the tarpon are on they're on they had a very healthy population of resident tarpon there and baby tarpon really that you know anywhere from and cool places to fish cool them, like place. back in the sticks oh yeah i mean it was it was a, there was a lot of casting under the mangroves you know, through little alleyways and having to pull the fish out and You're keep not it. seeing any snook in those areas no snook and didn't see a redfish anywhere, probably. No, I don't think they have redfish. What about mutton snapper on the flat? Did you see any? Oh, of those? yeah. A couple of those were caught. Really? Yep. Behind rays or just on their own? Just on their own. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. That's cool. Yep. That's something that was really a great fishery um, in Key West when I first showed up there was this mutton snappers on the flats. Yep. And uh, and they would catch big ones. And then for some reason, it just it just dried up. I don't know what happened. Some people would say that that was a uh, a learned behavior from a certain population of mutton snapper huh. that they would, um, you know, mutton snapper is typically a deeper water fish, but they do have a habit of coming up on the flats. Right. So some people would say that that uh, a certain population of mutton snappers would do that. They would go up on the flats, they would follow the rays, and they would go and feed on the flats, and people were catching those. Of course, anglers would keep them if they caught them. Yeah. But that wasn't enough to really have this all dry up, I don't right. think. So what some people thought was that there was this population of fish went out someplace and then they got hit with net fishing or huh. or somehow commercial fished Never because it just dried up. It just really dried up. I mean, people were catching those regularly, you know, like uh super slam, permit tarpon bonefish and mutton snapper. Huh. And uh People would catch them regularly, but it just really dried up and then never, never really saw them, but wow. it's happening again. It's starting to happen again. Um, so maybe they're, they're learning how to do it again, but that, that mutton snapper fishing, those things are cool. Yeah. And they, they, that's a, a good fight. Yeah. They fight good. They look a lot like a bonefish when they're, when they're coming down the flat, they're kind of gray, but they don't have that fork tail. Right. So you think you'll go back to Cuba? Yes, no doubt. Well, do you have any other trips on them? We'll go back to Mexico in November. Where do you go there? Um, go down to a place called Playa Blanca Lodge, which we fish uh, Espiritu Santo yes. Bay. And it is a fantastic place as well. And, and it's one of those places, too, that you do see some other fishermen down there, but not not a lot. It's very hard to get to. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's hard to get to by boat, um, but for the angler, it's pretty easy to get to. And you're fishing... Bonefish permit, tarpon, snook. You do have the opportunity for all that. That's kind of the one trip a year that I sell out and just go 100% permit. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Because that is, I mean, they do catch snook there, right? Oh, yeah, and some nice like that's, snook. Uh, that's, that's, um, I mean, that place is known for, for snook. the super slam. Yes. Like permit, bonefish, tarpon, yes. snook. Yes. And now in the, in the Keys, that's one place where you can do a super Duper slam, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, the, <laughs> the way snook, you call yeah. it. Yeah, the redfish. Oh, redfish. Uh, yeah, permit bonefish, yeah. tarpon, snook, and redfish in all in one day. That's that's a pretty amazing day. Uh, but it is possible. 
But that place that you're talking about, Permit Bonefish Tarpon Snook, that's Super Slam. And that, I think, is one of the best places in the world no doubt. to do it. It's a phenomenal place and an incredible fishery. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's an incredible fishery. and um, Good guides there too, right? Fantastic guides. We've been going down there for several years and and they're almost like family. I mean, yeah. they're, they're very knowledgeable, um, very friendly, and they exist to make sure you have a fun, enjoyable day on the water. So that's a, that's a question I'd like to ask you. If you've, you've fished all over, everywhere from um, where we first started, where we first met in the Rocky Mountains and mm-hmm. going down and fishing with um, the, the Rocky Mountain trout guides to Mexico to now Cuba, Bahamas, all the Florida Keys guides, some very notable ones that I know that you fish with. In your opinion, what, what's the definition of a good guide? A good guide? Um, someone that, you know, respects your ability and is okay with that. Someone that understands that, you know, catching, catching and boating a fish isn't the necessarily the end-all, be-all goal. You know, if they... A good guide will customize the day or the week to your ability as an angler to help you learn to maximize your ability as an angler, um, whether you're catching fish or learning how to cast to a fish. You know, I've always approached it as, you know, if I don't catch anything, I at least want to walk away having learned something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a good guide accommodates my me with that and you see that those qualities transcend geography like no doubt that's a good guide in the bahamas is a good guide in the rocky mountains and and they all have those same qualities you can have a guide out there that you'll go catch a ton of fish with but he could be the biggest a-hole in the world right you know and then the, the flip side is you could have a guide that you may go catch a few fish with but you're going to have the absolute best time and you're going to see things you've never seen in your life before, mm-hmm. you know, with that guide. And a lot of, a lot of the good guides will every now and then they'll tell you to stop what you're doing and look up, right? Look at that flamingo over there. Mm-hmm. Look at that so, cool fish, you know, that you're not fishing for. Look at that in its habitat, you know, or look at that right. cool flower. Right. I mean, cause you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it if you're not. Right. If, so, so with all that said, what makes a great guide? A great guide? A great guide. Because there are greats. And there yeah. are there are levels of guiding that, I mean, you'll have plenty of terrible guides. Lots of them. You have some good guides. And you have a few great guides. You know, the great guide's just someone that's just passionate about the process, the, the environment that they're working in, but just... And also just treats that animal or that fish like it's superhuman, like, you know, and then respects that, that fish. I mean, whether it's a half pound bone fish or a 25 pound permit, they're treating it the same way. Mm-hmm. And not only just physically treating that fish that way, but treating the, the process of fooling that fish into eating your fly it's, it's treating them one and the same and, and and or i guess playing down to your your angler that mm-hmm. makes a great guide i mean if somebody takes me fishing they're gonna they're gonna be different than when they take you fishing or somebody you know like a one of the really good anglers out there their names are, are escaping me now but they're gonna fish they're going to fish you the same, but they're going to make you feel like you're the best guy that stepped on their boat. Right. If that makes any sense. Well, it makes a lot of sense because what you said is that they're going to treat a half pound bone fish with the, with the same respect that they're going to treat a, a 20 pound bone fish. And you could say the same thing, in my opinion, about a great guide is going to treat all of their anglers that way. Yeah. Like the guy that comes to visit one time of the year yeah. or the guy that books a hundred days, yeah. it's all the same because that person treats guiding as the ultimate profession and there are a few there are a few out there 
And what I find with the great ones is that the, um, the clients revere them and covet the time with the great ones. There's no doubt. I mean, and I think, you know, something you taught me a long time ago is, you know, we were fishing guides out West and it was more of a summer job for me than it was you. It was a lifestyle and a passion for you, but the good guides, they treat it like a passion and that, and it is a part of their existence. And when you train both physically and mentally and you it, for that particular job and you learn the ins and outs of guiding and, and you do it because that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not that you have to do it. Right. It's because you are, you believe that you're, put on this earth to do that and that's that's a good guide right there i mean you don't just up and decide hey i'm going to be a fishing guide you know you maybe that's how it starts but the good ones survive and the good ones are successful and continuously booked with clients because they are passionate about it and they're enjoyable to be around and they just you slice their wrist and they bleed (laughs) fishing yeah yeah and and for somebody that hasn't experienced that um I know a lot of people that have gone on a lot of trips and they still haven't encountered that, that good guide. Well, they've encountered some good ones, but they haven't encountered the great one because yeah. the great one, you know, some of these people that I'm talking about are, um, they're going to go fishing one time a year. They're not going to put a lot of, they're not going to put a lot of effort into right. it. They're going to lob a call into me and say, Hey, uh, who could <laughs> I go with this weekend? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, the good guides or the great guides, the ones that we're talking about, they're booked a year in advance, year advance. and, uh, or more. And, um, it's, it's difficult to get them, but when you do, you will see the difference immediately. You will see the difference when you, when you pull up at the ramp and he's already there and he's waiting on you and his equipment is glistening and (laughs) everything is perfect. And you start talking and it just becomes immediately, you could see it in any profession. You could see it really in any profession. You could see somebody that is good at what they do. And then you can see somebody that is absolutely the best at what they do. And it is, it's, it's really cool to see. I mean, like the, the eye doctor I took Turner to, to have this, this procedure done on his eyes, he invented this procedure and he does more of these in a week than most people will do in a year. Wow. And so we go to him and the second that we walk into his office, I'm like, we're in the right place. Everything about this is right. Then we meet him and it's just like we're talking about. It's just everything from his, from his introduction to the way that he looks at you and his concern about Turner and okay, no problem. This, I see this all the time and this is what we're going to do. And don't worry. You just know you're in good hands. Yep. Like that's incredible. And you can get the same thing from a fishing guide. You can get the same thing from, from all different kinds of professions. So one thing I was thinking about the other day as we, as we start to kind of wrap this up, I used to have this, there would be a couple of situations where I would think of these situations, these fishing situations, and I would kind of call it like a Sunday afternoon kind of a a deal. And sometimes I'd be out there with my customers and everything would just be right. Like, man, it's down tide, down wind, Mm -hmm. down sun. Mm -hmm. The fish are there. The tide is perfect. I don't even have to try. And the fish are, you know, there's laid up tarpon everywhere and there's no boats in sight. And I'm like, man, this is like going fishing with my dad on a Sunday afternoon when you just, when everything is just perfectly right. So with all of the experience you've had fresh and salt water, you think about one of those type of situations. What, what, what comes to your mind? Like the perfect situation. And maybe, maybe you could redo it. Maybe you could go back and do it like right now. If you could put yourself in that situation, what would it be? It's like one I've experienced, you think? Yeah. I don't know. There was a, uh, there was a moment on the South Island of New Zealand 20 years ago. It was the last day of a two-week trip, and I had caught a couple of really nice trout on that entire two-week trip. You know, haven't broke the double digits yet, but caught a couple of eight pound brown and rainbows on dry flies. And I had a 
we had spotted a fish near the helicopter. Oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> That's how you fish down there. <laughs> um, <laughs> first world problems. Yeah, first world problems. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it was a big fish. And it was one of those deals where, you know, back here in the States, you're having to fish with a size 20 midge on 6X tippet to catch that type of fish. Well, there it was like a size two hummingbird. It was like a cicada. <laughs> That was that was massive, about the size of a tarpon fly, and and I, and it was everything was perfect, like you said. The wind, the fish was happy, and I popped that fly out there, and he swam about six feet over and ate the fly, and I totally whiffed <laughs> the fish, and I knew it was done because most of the time you get one shot at fish like that, and then they're gone. Yeah, and the guide's like, "Hold on, mate." He has, he's still there and he never spooked. And I put another cast out there and he ate it. And I said, I said the famous saying in down under is God save the queen and set the hook. And there he was. It was a <laughs> nine pound brown trout oh, wow. that gave me a second chance. Yeah. And that's what the trip ended on. And I'll never forget that the rest of my life. And it was just, you don't always get those second chances on fish like that. And you, very rarely do you ever get a second chance. And, and he gave me one. That's not the nicest fish or the best fish I've ever caught, but that's one of the coolest. Well, situations. rarely, rarely the, the the super memories are the biggest or or the most. But it's about what that made you feel like. Like a lot of people don't don't quite get that. Like, what did that make you feel like? Like, why is that a memory that's going to stay with you for the rest of your life? Well, just the setting I was in, and you know the. As I looked up, when I caught that fish, I looked up to where, and where I was and just the, just the place I was, I was in. But, and I, I'll, I'll, if you've got time, I'll tell you another one real quick. So we talk about chasing permit mm -hmm. and you can listen to all kinds. You can listen to Will Benson's Orvis podcast and, and it's pretty good on permit, but you got to be willing to spend a ton of money and be ready for failure and disappointment catching permit. You know that mm -hmm. you're awesome at it. Well, I'd done that very thing and i'm still <laughs> doing it to this day but i've caught a few and um when i caught my first one in mexico it was a 25 pound just beautiful permit i probably never should have caught it i'll never forget that day uh, I, I, I remember what i was wearing i remember who was with me on the boat i remember my guide i remember everything about it like it was yesterday but that that one moment where i caught that my first permit was a was a culmination of 15 solid years of chasing these fish around the world yeah. and not being successful and being ultra frustrated and spending thousands of dollars on weeks fishing and coming up empty handed right and to have that feeling that satisfaction of being able to trick a smart game fish like that into eating my fly and actually holding it in something that powerful in my hands was just, it was un, not of this world. It was awesome. It, and the interesting thing about that is that that doesn't mean anything to 99% of the people in the world. Right. But to those few folks who chase that fish or any type of big game whether you're on land or water you understand exactly what i'm talking about and that'll probably be some of the last thoughts i have in this life is <laughs> catching that fish and how that bubble was burst now did it did it make the second fish or the third fish any easier no i still get frustrated as all get out yeah. trying to catch them but I always remember that day yeah well one of the things that you said about the new zealand thing was that ask you why it meant so much to you and you said that you took the time to look up and look mm -hmm. around and where see you where were. you are and so so often fishing of any sort any kind of fishing freshwater saltwater spin fishing conventional fly fishing whatever it is it takes you to these places and sometimes you get so focused on on catching these fish that you forget to to look around and see see where you are and some of the some of the places and memories that I can think of are times exactly when I did exactly that like we used to go on to Flat Creek. It's one of my uh, places. Yes. Flat Creek is one of my places where yeah. I, I talk about all the time. Like, you know, if I could have just an hour to fish, I think it might be there. Flat Creek. Like, 
to some people, you know, Flat Creek's not going to have the biggest fish in it. It's full of cutthroats. Some people think they're stupid and whatever, but they hang out under the bank mm -hmm. and they do that little bank feeding thing where they slip their head out and they, and they eat. And, you know, I can think of so many days where I had been on the boat every day and dealing with two customers and teaching people how to fish and everything. And then just deciding today is my first day off and I'm unhooking that boat. I'm not taking all that stuff with me. And I'm going over here and I'm going to put a box of flies in my pocket mm -hmm. and I'm not even taking lunch. Yeah. And I'm just going to sit there and I'm going to work one fish. I don't even need to catch five fish, 10 yep. fish, 20 fish. I'm going to catch one. And you go there and, and all of a sudden you're in your shirt sleeves and the, 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 the weather is perfect. You're not hot. You're not cold. It's just absolutely perfect. And you can see everything and nobody's bothering you. And maybe you catch it. Maybe you don't. But you look around, and you're just like, man, look at where I am. Mm. I'm in the middle yeah. of this giant meadow with this unbelievable stream flowing in front of me that's full of these fish. This is crazy. I don't know. And there's, I, I have some similar situations in saltwater and the Marquesas and different things where, you know, you just look out there and, and everything is going right. And those, me those memories are so important because, I don't know, to spend your life fishing, most of it is not going to be right. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? True. It's like, it's like <laughs> you hit that day when everything is right. Like it's perfect. It is, it's absolutely perfect. No, there's not one challenging condition. The light's perfect. There are no clouds. The sun's, you know, blaring down on you. The, the, the wind is perfect. The tide's perfect. There's nobody out there in front of you and the fish are behaving like they're supposed to. Right. Like that's the situation I'm talking about. And that those New Zealand situations that you talked about, that's that's incredible. I don't know, man. Here's to here's to uh finding some more of those. No not, doubt. Not just not just the New Zealand ones and not just the ones that we've had, but I look forward to I look forward to the 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 other ones and and I think that's why you gotta you just gotta keep planning. Keep going. Keep planning the trips. Keep playing hard. We That's kind of our motto. We're going to keep doing it. <laughs> keep pushing it. Well, that's cool, man. Well, I appreciate you sitting down and telling us about Cuba. And uh, next time you go, I'm definitely interested. Good. Yeah. I need to go with us. Yeah. It'd be fun. Good times. All right, Clay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope you got something out of that. Got just a little bit of news. We have started a weekly show that is designed to be up to the minute videos of what's happening this week, mostly in the Florida Keys, but also in other places that we fish as well. We'll be putting that out every week. And the best way to find that is to subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube slash Saltwater Experience. Search Saltwater Experience on YouTube, subscribe to that channel, and you will get updates of when a new video is published. I've also figured out how to put the podcast on YouTube, finally. A lot of people like to put that window behind other things they're working on and listen to the podcast while they are working. So we now have that for you. And there is a playlist called podcast. There's a playlist called weekly show. You can go and see all the new videos that we're putting up there. Started a new email address specifically for this show. And that is podcast at saltwaterexperience.com podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. Those emails come directly to me. I'll see every single one of them. So if you have comments, suggestions, ways we can make the show better, and particularly if you have suggestions of someone you would like to see me sit down with in the hunting world, in the fishing world, in the outdoor sports world, or just a motivation, inspirational character, or someone that can teach us all something. I'm very interested in your suggestions. So that's podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. You can get the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and we're also publishing it on the blog. The weekly show will be published on the blog too, but the best way is to go to YouTube, subscribe there, and you'll get it immediately when it's published. So until next week, thanks for listening. And we'll see you soon.